Hi folks, I'm Woody. Welcome back to the shed. You might recall this incident about a year ago, which was, as far as I could work out, the result of carburetor icing. It was a day where uh, icing was a distinct possibility, but I thought that the temperatures under the bonnet would be high enough to prevent it. However, if we look at the air in, um, intake on the cowling, we can see the majority of the air for the carburettor is forced through this venturi and doesn't have time to be warmed before it gets swallowed by the intake in the carburettor. I needed some kind of heater for the carb air, or better still, some means of stopping ice forming in the throttle body by heating it up. A common way of doing this with an air-cooled engine is to draw heat from the exhaust. I tried this, but the arrangement wasn't effective and a bit sort of um, cumbersome. A tube sat over the muffler box and a flat valve under the float chamber allowed some control, but it didn't work very well. There was an electric heater available for the Nikki car, but it was expensive. That might be a price I'd be prepared to pay, but I couldn't find any information on its performance, its technical specification or anything else come to that. I noticed it's also no longer listed on the website, so I guess it didn't work either. I decided to make my own in the end. It was clearly going to be better to try to stop the ice forming by heating the car body rather than the air that was going into it. After a few false starts, I settled on using these things for a heat source. They're used in 3D printers to melt the plastic compound and only draw a small amount of power, but produce a lot of heat very quickly. I got four of them from eBay for less than £12, and they're rated at 40 watts at 12 volts. Here's a benchtop trial of it. You can see how quickly it heats up when placed directly on the temperature probe. I put the heating element inside a 6mm internal diameter bronze tube which runs the width of the carb under the point where the butterflies are going to be. The tube is held in place by locking wire and the heater by exhaust repair putty and wire. Uh, I've used one for the majority of the installation. I did try two but one of them went US very quickly and uh, perhaps the, uh, the tube gets too hot for both of them. I'm not really sure but I'm running with one at the moment. The wiring diagram is here. A steel tie wrap passes around the body to hold a temperature sensor probe with a readout in the cockpit. This is the cheap aquarium thermometer, not designed for this use, so not surprisingly that it and its replacement fell quite quickly. The switch and the warning light were put in convenient places in the cockpit, although I've since had to move the switch to make room for an extra ignition switch. More on that later on. OK, let's move on to the fuel supply problem. After the last 50 hour service, I suffered a loss of power on climb away from low level. At the same time, the RPM indications fluctuated wildly between 2200 and 4800 RPM. It's an impossible figure. I quickly switched on the electric booster pump and things immediately returned to normal. After some experiments then, I found that the engine would lose power and eventually stop if I made high demands on the fuel, as a full throttle climb without the booster pump on, or pulled more than about 2.5 G. During the service procedure, I would replaced the plugs, but also the fuel filter, so I checked that was OK. Then I suspected that the modification to the crankcase oil breather might have had some unforeseen result. Then I replaced the Mycuni vacuum pump. None of these things solved the problem. So I replaced the fuel hoses, all except one. And I'll come back to that. But in the middle of all this chasing of phantoms, this happened.
Okay, so there's a bit of video splicing there, but it happened just as you saw, with about 5 to 10 seconds of flight time, my shortest sortie yet. The engine lost power again, but now continued to run, but very roughly. The fuel booster pump was on, which it always is for takeoff, so the symptoms persist, but the cure no longer works. As you might imagine, things are now getting a bit confusing. Did I have a fuel problem? An electrical snag? Something wrong with the carburetor? I swapped the carb for a new one on a new engine. No changes. I changed the fuel filter back to the old one. No improvement. I changed the plugs again. Nothing changed. Then I had what they call a light bulb moment. This now seems obvious with hindsight, but with one cylinder apparently dead, I changed the plug leads over. The dead cylinder was now on the other side. So, what will cause this to happen? This is a diode. It's simply an electrical non-return valve. About a centimetre long, it costs less than a box of matches. The SC33 engine has two of these. The loss of one of them nearly cost me my aeroplane. This engine operates two magnetos. These are grounded through a single P-lead which allows the use of a single mag switch, whereas most aircraft have two. So why? This saves the huge cost and enormous weight of that second switch. I'm not going to try to explain any more than that. I just got rid of the diodes and put in another mag switch. End of the problem in that area, at least, but I had to do some rearranging of the switch positions. And, of course, I still had the fuel problem. So, do you remember that I said there was, an, there was one fuel hose I didn't replace? Since I didn't have a length of hose long enough, the piece between the fuel filter and the electric booster pump, whilst checked it was clear and in good condition, was reattached, but with a 90 degree brass union to make the routing a bit, e a bit neater, and I'd done that prior to the service. The barbs on the brass are quite sharp, and I had to twist it back in, back and forth, to fit into the hose. This is the hose. It's now just a short piece, so very easy to see through, but it looks okay, doesn't it? No obstructions. Now look at this. My turning of the hose fitting has cut a sort of flap away from the wall. This was okay till I removed the fitting to check the hose, and then refitted it. The flap of rubber was now dislodged enough to form a partial restriction of fuel flow. Not enough to stop the engine unless the vacuum pump needed to work quite hard, like under G-loads, to get fuel through. The extra pull of the booster pump overcame the problem. This is what happened as I took the video to show all this. The brass fitting eventually cut the rubber flap away from the sidewall, and, well, the result of this bit of loose junk in the fuel system isn't too difficult to imagine. So, in future, I'll only be using fuel fittings that look like this, with no nasty sharp edges. So, that's it for this episode. I hope you found it useful and it might save you some time and effort in future. Now that I've solved the issues, well, she sounds really nice, doesn't she?